Hey everybody, I'm Aaron in for Halley, and tonight this never-ending scorching heat wave is now expanded to include Northern California as this heat wave becomes even more deadly. A man in his 70s died at the trailhead in Death Valley National Park. That's his temperatures there soared above 120 degrees. Officials think this is heat-related, making it the second death there this summer. We are also learning about a woman who was just arrested for the death of a 10-month-old after she left the infant in a car in Florida for hours, the temperature inside that car reaching 133 degrees. From coast to coast, really, nearly 90 million people are under heat alerts today, with more records expected to be broken. That's after more than two dozen were just smashed yesterday. And to North Carolina, too, where people are starting to pick up the pieces now after that tornado we told you about tore through a community there, ripping off roofs, knocking down power lines. The National Weather Service says it was an EF3 tornado. That's actually an upgrade. It was on the ground across almost 17 miles for about 30 minutes. And overseas, southern Europe also can't seem to catch a break from the blazing sun. Another heat wave starting there today. Italian hospitals seeing a jump in emergencies as a result. Local media there describe it as the week of hell. And in Greece, wildfires raging through the country's forests, burning through houses, forcing people to evacuate. Italy, France, Romania, Poland, Slovakia, they've all sent either planes or firefighters trying to help battle the flames they're dealing with there. We have meteorologist Bill Cairns on all of this for us. First, let's go to Marissa Parra in Coral Gables, Florida, and talk a little bit more about the heat we're seeing. Marissa, it's been more than a month of these temperatures there in the Miami area where you are. Talk to us about just how bad it is and what people are doing to sort of beat the heat there for days on end. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, you look at that map and you'll notice a lot of these places are places that are no stranger to heat. But as Bill Cairns is probably about to say from his air conditioned studio here, I think the big difference here is just the stretch, the consecutive days. I mean, we've probably broken records. The amount of times we're talking about records being broken, 26 records broken just yesterday across the country. We had a record for the consecutive stretch of days here in Miami that we saw a heat index in the triple digits. And then over in the southwest, another record broken for consecutive of days of temperatures, not the heat index, but just straight temps above 110. Now, listen, it's not just uncomfortable to be outside. It is actually straight up dangerous. And we have seen how this has played out, how this has become deadly for several people and, and for different reasons, right? In the southwest, you see asphalt heat up. We, we ourselves took the temperature of the asphalt. It clocked upwards of 160 degrees. We talked to burn units who are filling up with burn victims, by the way, in the southwest. And they were talking about how the asphalt can burn you in seconds in places like Phoenix because that asphalt can get upwards of 180 degrees. We've seen people, particularly people who are outside, probably because they either are working outside or people who do not have a home or don't have access to air conditioning. We have seen deaths and fatalities as a result of that. Over in Miami, um, we know that in Florida, there was a fatality. You just mentioned a woman who was arrested and charged in northern Florida for leaving an infant inside of a vehicle, inside of a garage. That infant in that 133-degree vehicle, that infant had an internal body temperature of 110 degrees. So when we talk about the dangers of this, regardless of whether it's someone who is trapped outside in the southwest or someone that's inside of a vehicle, we have seen physicians talk about a rise in patients because of heat-related injuries, whether it's heat exhaustion, whether it's heat stroke, or people with those critically high internal body temperatures. This is something, again, Erin, uh, we talk about the dangers of this. It is the consecutive stretch that is also putting a strain on first responders, these cooling shelters that are opening around the South, as well as, as those in hospitals who are tending to the victims of all of this. Erin? Wow, scary times for sure, Marissa. We appreciate the reporting. You and your team get inside now. I know it's like 100 degrees, the heat index where you are, so thanks a lot. Let's turn to meteorologist Bill Karens now and talk a little bit more about this uh, heat we're dealing with. So Marissa laid out the heat situation here in the U.S., but it's not just us right now, Bill, right? What, what are we seeing out in Europe at this point? Uh, the European heat wave, it looks like it peaked a little bit two days ago, kind of went down a little bit, and now it's coming back. So we have these heat domes, and these are what are responsible this time of year. Uh, it's huge areas of high pressure that are just a lot of air sinking, and that means the air can really heat up well. And so that's in areas of the southwest, as we know, and also the areas here in Europe. So the heat dome in the western U.S. is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. We have this Atlantic big area. Uh, the Atlantic's way warmer than it should be. And then also heading towards Iraq and Iran and uh, many areas 
areas out here by Saudi Arabia, they're seeing exceptionally hot temperatures too. So let's focus just in on Europe. And Northern Europe is fine. You haven't heard about London or anything like that with heat waves this summer, not like last year. This is over southern portions of Europe. This is hot air that's moved off the northern coast of Africa. It's still over the southern half of Italy, easily going to be here uh, right around 100 the next two days. Athens has probably been one of the poster children for the hottest, I mean, 103 and 105 as we head towards the weekend, Aaron. That's where you'll see the headlines this weekend. And we mentioned what they had to deal with in the Carolinas, too, Bill. There's a severe storm threat that we're seeing tonight, too, right? Yeah, we have a couple areas of concern. Mostly it's going to be a wind damage threat. We've already seen numerous reports of wind damage in areas of Tennessee. So we got this enhanced risk area. It includes a lot of big cities here, Detroit to Cleveland to Erie, Pittsburgh included, Columbus too. And later this evening, we'll get some really big storms out here in areas of western Kansas. And then we have a flash flood threat too. Uh, don't be surprised you see some stories about flash flooding tomorrow morning, especially in areas of eastern Tennessee. So this is the areas for the wind damage threats, Detroit and Cleveland include, included in that, and maybe even some hurricane gusts. We do have two severe thunderstorm watches. We have a ton of rain that has moved down out of Tennessee through Chattanooga and now into northern portions of Georgia. And North Georgia has mountains too. And you don't like heavy rain training over those areas. So that's one concern. And then further up towards the north, a large severe thunderstorm watch. Looks like Detroit, you're in the clear after your thunderstorms just rolled through. Now we're going to wait and see how bad these storms are as they head towards Cleveland and Columbus later on tonight. So we had our hands full, Aaron, once again. Yeah, so much to keep an eye on. Bill Cairns, we appreciate you. Thanks. Let's take you overseas now, where we are getting new details about the American soldier who's in custody now in North Korea. That's after he bolted across the border with South Korea into really one of the most volatile regions anywhere on the planet. This is a bizarre story. And there are some members of Travis King's family now saying they're worried about the fate of the 23-year-old. I think this problem is that he needs help. You know, that's not Travis. Uh, out of his character, I've never seen him get down like that ever so something must so be. something is going on mm -hmm. this isn't him it is not his personality and we're also starting to learn more about king's last months in south korea a south korean official telling us he spent 48 days in prison there being released earlier this month he was supposed to come back to the u.s when he got out but he didn't have all the documents he needed to actually get onto a plane, apparently. Instead, King got away from military officials at the airport and ended up with a tour group headed to the border. He sprinted across the border, really shocking the tourists who were around him at that point. Matt Bradley has more now from Seoul. Yes, we just got some troubling new details about the events that led up to this young private mad dash across the border into North Korea. Now, we knew that he was implicated or at least had been detained or accused of at least one, possibly two different assaults at two different nightclubs or bars. Now, we also know that he was serving detention in a South Korean prison while he was working or while he was enlisted in the U.S. military here in South Korea. Now, he decided to spend 48 days, and right after that was when he decided to make his mad dash across the border. Now, what that was was not a separate, yet another third assault. It turns out that he was deciding he made a choice to go to prison and spend 48 days there in lieu of paying a fine for damaging a police car. And that was an altercation that occurred while he was being detained by police during one of those two previous assaults. So basically, this young man decided that instead of paying the $5,000 fine, he would do what some South Koreans are able to do, which is spend 48 days in prison, essentially doing labor. And once he was released on July 10th, that was when, a, a week later, he joined a guided tour, went to the border, and decided to make that very treacherous uh, move across the border, one that has now exploded into an international diplomatic crisis. Now, we've also heard from U.S. officials today, my, part, uh, my colleague, Courtney Kuby interviewed the Secretary of the Army, and she said that it turns out that the United States has had no real direct contact with anyone in North Korea, despite efforts to try to contact the North Koreans through the United Nations, through the South Koreans, and through the Swedish embassy in Pyongyang. And the fact is, is that we're not going to know anything more about the fate of this young soldier, Private Travis King, before we hear from the North Koreans. And right now, the overwhelming sound we're hearing from North Korea is silence on this troubling matter. Matt Bradley for us in South Korea tonight. Right here in Washington, a close aide of former President Donald Trump who may have unique insight 
on the days after Trump lost the 2020 election, is testifying today before a federal grand jury. We're talking about William Russell here. You see him here on the, Mr. Trump's left, just moments before he spoke to the crowd of supporters who would go on to launch that deadly Capitol attack. So here's what we know about Russell at this point. He's a former White House aide who helped organize the former president's trips. He is still in the Trump circle now. He's working for his 2024 campaign. He's also already testified more than once before Jack Smith's grand jury. But, and this is what's really interesting to us today, Russell is not mentioned a single time in the January 6th committee's final report. Garrett Hake is joining us now to talk a little bit more about this. So the January 6th committee didn't mm -hmm. want to talk to Russell, but... Jack Smith's grand jury wants to hear from him. What do we know about why that is? Well, look, it's a reminder that the federal government has powers to compel testimony that the January 6th committee lacked and that they were able to go deeper with lots of folks. I mean, look, Russell is a relatively junior aide, or was in the Trump White House, but as that picture demonstrates, he's somebody who has a personal aide to the president would have had close proximity to him. So maybe he's somebody who overheard something. Maybe he's somebody whose version of events contradicts that of another witness. That's the kind of thing that might explain why he keeps getting called to testify over and over and over again. He's been hard to track down. He hasn't appeared in public, but he is still in the Trump inner circle. So he knows something of value to these prosecutors, and I guess we're all going to find out together if and when there's an indictment. Yeah, eventually we'll see, right? I understand that uh, the special counsel also spoke with Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, look, this is another one that's not surprising that it happened. It's just a matter of nailing down the details. Giuliani was kind of the godfather of the whole Stop the Steal movement. We knew that from the January 6th committee, to be sure. This is somebody who was in the president's ear all the time, saying you ought to fight this. He was filing lawsuits. He was traveling the country talking about these issues. He was a central figure. We learned that he talked to investigators back sometime in the early spring in New York City. What's interesting to me is, are they talking to him as a witness, or are they talking to him as somebody who they think might also potentially face charges? Again, we don't know the answers to those questions yet, but he has not received a target letter, at least as of right now. And since that last target letter went to the former president, we're, what, five, a little after five o'clock on mm -hmm. Thursday, so he's not going to speak to the grand jury here in D.C. Um, at the same time, he's asking the House to, to sort of remove the impeachments from his record, right? That's right. And it's not really a power that the House has. They can vote on what's called an expungement, but it doesn't do anything. I mean, impeachments happen, right? I mean, you can pass a resolution that says basically anything you want, but nothing will take away the fact that we all lived through those two impeachments. That said, uh, my sources say Donald Trump is enamored of this idea. He wants to see the House take a vote on it. He wants the House leaders, particularly Kevin McCarthy, to be more vocal about it. Uh, but the oldest rule in Congress is if you have the votes, you take the votes. So what it tells me is House Republicans don't have a majority yet to make this happen, regardless of how much Donald Trump might want it. All right. So many more moves to see uh, in this case. Uh, Garrett Hake, we appreciate the reporting. Thanks. You bet. Fireworks today at a Republican-led House committee hearing. This one centered around testimony from the 2024 Democratic presidential hopeful Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Now, Democrats taking this opportunity really to torch this potential spoiler candidate the hearing held by a committee focused on the so-called weaponization of the government with today's focus on censorship in this country. Democrats using their time to go after a man known for conspiracy theories and potentially siphoning votes away from President Biden. Listen. There's no secret that this is an amplification of his own platform. One of our Republican witnesses encourages this appalling rhetoric and promotes anti-Asian hate with dangerous and unfounded claims. Extreme mega Republicans elevate a man who tells others that vaccines aren't safe. Now, Kennedy's gotten a ton of backlash in recent days from both some folks on both sides of the aisle after he implied that the COVID pandemic was somehow designed to spare certain Jews and Chinese people, which he says was taken out of context. NBC's Ali Vitali is joining us now to talk a little bit more about this from her post on the Hill. So, Ali, what's the the undercurrent here, right? Did Republicans really want to hear from RFK Jr. on this particular topic? What was the motivation, as you understand it? Yeah. It's a really good question because certainly he's not the first person to have his accounts disabled because he spread, in this case, misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine on his Instagram page. But nevertheless, he is the person that Republicans on the House Weaponization Select Committee decided to put forward as a key witness here. Of course, one of the things that that allowed them to do is to spotlight the fact that this is a man, Robert Kennedy Jr., who Democrats would prefer to ignore 
And of course, there's a certain irony to having that man be the central witness at a hearing about censorship. But the other piece of it was really just being able to use a Democrat to kind of troll Democrats. But frankly, most of this hearing did not focus in Democrats questioning Kennedy regarding censorship. Instead, it was a lot about past comments like the ones that you just referenced. Listen. Do you think it was just as hard to wear a mask during COVID as it was to hide under floorboards or false walls so you weren't murdered or dragged to a concentration camp? Of course not. That's okay. ridiculous. But that's a comparison that you made. And if this were a slip of the tongue, Mr. Kennedy, or a one-off comment, we would all move on. But there's a deeply disturbing pattern. There were several other exchanges like that, Aaron, with Democratic members pushing Kennedy on statements that he's made and then tried to explain away. He continued to do that in front of this committee. And again, it was just another example of how Republicans are using the power of the gavel here to really give a lot of red meat to their base. Censorship and big tech is something that Republicans have talked about a lot. It fits into that narrative of the culture wars, but then also the fact that they are doing it with Biden's really only, aside from Marianne Williamson, Democratic challenger. I think that was sort of an added benefit to a committee that really does like to push the envelope. Yeah, very quickly, though, on the Democrat side, what do you think was, was going on here for them? What about the strategy from House Democrats that we saw today showing up to the hearings full force, really, versus what we saw with Republicans and the January 6th committee, where most of them refused to join? What do you make of it? Yeah. Lessons learned. Think about the ways that a lot of the criticism of the January 6th committee's work from the Republican side was that there were no Republicans there to rebut it in real time. It's what made the January 6th committee such a fascinating and, frankly, difficult to replicate select committee because all of the members, Republican and Democrat alike, were marching in lockstep on pushing the same narrative using the same evidence to drive at the same points. That's not how most congressional hearings actually work. Typically, you watch them ping pong between Republicans Republican talking points, then Democratic talking points, and on and on. That's what we saw today. And it's really Democrats taking a cue from Republicans who stonewalled the January 6th committee and wouldn't participate, by and large, unless you had the two Republicans, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, who, of mm. course, were of the same mindset on January 6th. Instead, what we're watching here is Democrats learning that lesson and rebutting in real time, much in the same way that we see them do in most normal congressional hearings. Ali Vitale for us on the Hill tonight. Ali, thank you. The murder of rapper Tupac making headlines again. NBC News today first to obtain a search warrant. Las Vegas Metro Police served on a home, and it's giving us more details into exactly what they were looking for. Now, according to this warrant on Monday, police searched the home of Dwayne Keith Davis. Now, police had previously said he was in the suspected shooter's car when Tupac was killed. Almost 30 years ago, police found a USB drive, an iPhone, some iPads, and laptops, among other things, in the house. Now, you might remember Tupac died at the age of 25 after being shot during a drive-by in Las Vegas. That was in 1996. There has never been an arrest in this case. So let's go to Kristen Dahlgren for more on this. Kristen, uh, what do we know about the man whose house was searched and, and what it might tell us, this search might tell us about this investigation? Right, Aaron. So the house uh, belonged to Keefe D, a 60-year-old uh, who has been openly talking for years about his involvement. His nephew uh, was believed to be the shooter in the case, Orlando Anderson, according to police. He was never charged. He denied uh, any involvement. And he was killed in a gang-related killing uh, about two years after Tupac. So uh, Davis has been giving police some information as part of a limited prosecution agreement agreement. Uh, of the four that were believed to be in that car, he is the only one who is surviving at this point. So really could be key uh, in any type of evidence, in any type of prosecution. Um, the evidence that they took, they clearly were looking at his digital footprint, taking those iPads, those laptops, uh, iPhones. And they also were looking as well at some of the statements he's made, uh, at some things that he said in books as well. So those are the types of things that they've been looking in that. We don't uh, know exactly what evidence it is that led them to get this search warrant. So it will be interesting to see where this goes from here, Aaron.
But it, and it is curious, right? I mean, sort of where did this all come from? It's been 30 years, like we said, nearly 30 years since Tupac was killed. The, the, the person who was sort of the primary suspect at one time is dead as well. Why is this making headlines now? Why are we talking about this now? Where did it come from? Right. Well, it's still an open case uh, and one that has been going on for so long. And Tupac, of course, has this sort of legendary mythical status at mm -hmm. this point. Uh, you know, we have some of his accomplishments, a six-time Grammy nominee. This June, he was awarded a posthumous uh, star on the Walk of Fame. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so, you know, he five number one albums there, has sold 33 million albums. And his fame has only seemed to grow over the years with this sort of of uh, mythical nature and the mystery about his death. And so still a lot of questions, a lot of people who would like to see some type of justice or at least closure in this case. Yeah, that mystery and a lot of his music still timeless. Kristen Dahlgren for us today. Kristen, thank you. You bet. Let's take you to New Zealand now, where the U.S. women's soccer team getting ready to defend their title with their first match kicking off tomorrow night. The tournament started today with the two host countries, New Zealand and Australia, winning their first matches. That's less than 24 hours after that deadly shooting in a busy area near where the fans are staying in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. The prime minister there telling people today it is still safe to go to the World Cup. Watch. I will be going. It is safe to go. Um, and we and, you know, continue to encourage the Auckland community to get behind this event. We want to bring in Andres Cantor now, Telemundo's chief soccer commentator, live in Auckland for us. Uh, Andres, thank you so much for being with us tonight. The U.S. team going to try to claim a third successive World Cup crown here. Our Molly Hunter had a chance to sit down with the team captain, Alex Morgan. I want to play a little bit of that, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. We do set expectations for ourselves. We do want to find ourselves at the end. We do mm -hmm. want to be hoisting the trophy at the end to get there is a long way. So, Andres, what do you expect? What do you expect to see from Team USA tomorrow night? Aaron, good morning from this uh, part of the world. I think that long way is seven games, and I think the U.S. national team has a very good balance of experienced players like Alex Morgan and very young and upcoming players like the Sofia Huertas, like the Trinity Rodmans. Uh, you name it. So I think the U.S. can make it all the way to the final. They're not going to have an easy task in the quarters and semis where it's going to get tougher, obviously, than in the group phase. But I am very confident that the U.S. women's national team can make it all the way through to the final in Sydney. Yeah, a lot of people agreeing with you on that. Uh, you know, here in the U.S., even for people who aren't soccer fans, we know that you are a legend in the soccer world, in part because of your uh, iconic voice at so many matches. I want to play a little bit of that for our viewers, and then we'll talk. You know, uh, you love soccer. You love football. I know that uh, people know that about you. <laughs> what are you looking forward to the most? What matches are really going to generate the most excitement for you? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, last night here in New Zealand, it was a great match, the opening match. Uh, New Zealand beat uh, uh, Norway 1-0, and, you know, the goal was a beautiful goal. And obviously, I'm looking forward to all the U.S. women's national teams. Uh, it's it's going to be very interesting to see how the competition is catching up to the rest of, you know, the rest of the world is catching up to the U.S. I think England has a good team, so I'm looking forward to call their games. I'm looking forward to call the France against Brazil match. But obviously, I'm pumped up, pumped up and ready to go tomorrow. The game here is going to be at 1 p.m. local on a Saturday afternoon, which is uh, not a usual kickoff time for a football soccer match. But uh, hopefully the U.S. women's national team will be ready. And so we will be in Telemundo and Peacock, where we will have the game prime time on Friday night at home. Yep, we will be watching uh, the team and watching you for the commentary as well. Andres Cantor, we appreciate your time today. Thank you, sir. Well, stay with us. We have some breaking news. We are just learning about the NFL approving the sale of the Washington Commanders to a new owner. We're going to tell you why the old owner has to pay a multi-million dollar fine on his way out the door. Stick around for that. Plus, how much money a Florida jury is awarding a little girl who was burned by a chicken McNugget?
That's later in our five things. A possible new solution for people who want to kick a pretty common, kind of nasty little habit. We're going to tell you about that in a few minutes. First, though, we want to bring you tonight's Newsmaker exclusive. Our health and medical reporter, Erica Edwards, spoke one-on-one -on -one with the new CDC director, Dr. Mandy Cohen. It is her first sit-down interview since starting the position less than two weeks ago now. She is taking the reins at a critical time with the CDC going through massive internal changes. And Americans' trust in that agency is at an all-time low right now. Here's the story. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, once considered the gold standard of public health, finds itself at a crossroads. It's time for a new chapter. Trust in the CDC plummeted during the height of the pandemic. Presidential candidates continue to slam the agency. We've seen over the past few years uh, really the, the bankruptcy uh, of the public health establishment. From both sides of the aisle. The CDC, the World Health Organization, the, the National those Academy of Sciences. are captive agencies. Vaccine misinformation, surges in drug overdoses, unprecedented gun deaths, all considered major issues the CDC must tackle, even amid a proposed funding cut of more than a billion dollars. This is what Dr. Mandy Cohen faces Mark. as she takes the helm of the agency. Why did you want this job? <laughs> I have dedicated my career to making impact in the health space. And so when an opportunity to lead an agency whose mission is to protect the health of this country and really the world, that was an easy answer. It was yes. First on her long list of goals, rebuilding credibility lost because of some CDC missteps during the pandemic. If we want to protect the health of every American, we have to first make sure that we are building trust with the American people. And I know some of that trust was lost in the last few years. But I'm here to refocus the organization on building that trust. How will you do that differently, though, from your predecessors? Is that engaging press briefings more? How, how will you get that message out to people who really need to hear that? Well, first, it starts with the whole team at CDC. Trust is not just built with me uh, doing something different. It's all of us being different. Um, and at my first all-hands meeting here at CDC last week, the first thing we talked about was trust. And Cohen might just be able to do it because of her experience speaking to the public and politicians. As Health Secretary of North Carolina, Cohen, a Democrat, helped convince conservatives to expand Medicaid in the state. And she was the face of daily state-run COVID briefings. Do you know your three W's? Wear, wait, wash? Whose down-to-earth guidance was met with little political pushback. Those are going to be really important skills as you face budget cuts, how are you going to handle that moving forward with Washington? I want to make sure that they know me, um, how I operate, how we can work together. I want to make sure I know what's on their mind because, look, they're the ones that are investing behind the CDC. On Wednesday, Cohen was on Capitol Hill meeting with both Democrats and Republicans. This is a bipartisan issue to make sure that our country is safe and protected. Beyond politics, she's facing the very real impact of climate change on Americans' health, from extreme heat to air pollution from wildfires, even threatening to add new viruses to the mix, which Cohen says the CDC is tracking closely. Look, we saw for the first time a few cases of domestically acquired malaria, um, which we hadn't seen in 20 years. On a scale of 1 to 10, how concerned should Americans be about malaria? You should not be concerned at all. So right now, you should not be concerned at all. I'm worrying about it for you. <laughs> but that's not all that worries Cohen. What do you think is the biggest threat to public health right now that we face? The thing that I am most worried about is this broken, broken trust. For us to be strong as a nation, we need to make sure that we trust each other. And, and that's, that's about public health, but it's about so much more than that. Unfortunately, in the United States, life expectancy is actually going down. You know, for such a rich and prosperous country, for our life expectancy to be going down, we really need to ha take a hard look to say, like, well, how can we do better? For Cohen, doing better starts with her new co-workers, even as she's still learning her way around the building. Sometimes I'll just go to a random floor in one of the buildings and I'll just wander around and pop into a meeting. <laughs> Her very first day on the job, greeting employees at the door with Alicia Keys songs playing in the background, all part of her plan to get the CDC on board with her goals. 
one of my values that I bring here to work um, is joy, right? We want to have joy at work. And that's not just about parties and celebrations, but it's about connecting with the mission. But you need to have a little fun at work in order to bring your A game. Um, I really think the American people deserve the everyone's A game. They deserve my best and they deserve the best from this agency. And Erica Edwards joins us now. Erica, some really good insights into how this new director is going to operate and how she thinks there are a lot of big public health issues right now for the country to be focused on. You talked about so many of the issues. What did she say about gun violence, about the mental health crisis in this country? Hey, Aaron. Yeah, so Dr. Cohen did not address gun violence directly, but she did say that it's the CDC's role to collect data and research about the public health impact of guns. That way, legislatures and indeed the American public can make informed decisions about the issues based on science. We also talked extensively about mental health. As you know, the CDC recently came out with several really concerning reports about rises in rates of depression and sadness, especially among girls. Dr. Cohen herself has two young daughters. And she says that the CDC can't work alone in solving the mental health crisis. It's going to take a big collaboration between public health officials, doctors, um, and young families, even schools. I do want to bring up, I did ask her about another controversial topic, abortion. She said that it is the CDC's duty to make sure that all women have access to health care whenever they need it. And she said that abortion is a form of medical care. Aaron. All right, Erica Edwards for us. Great interview. Erica, thank you in Atlanta tonight. Thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, take a look at this huge explosion. This is in Johannesburg, South Africa. It has officials there just mystified. One person was actually killed. Dozens of people hurt here. You can see it tossed vehicles, left a big crack in the road there. Nobody has any idea what caused this, but officials say people should stay away from that area. Number two, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is going to ask the Supreme Court to review his conviction in the murder of George Floyd. That's according to his lawyer, who said the court needs to look at whether Chauvin was denied a fair trial. This comes after Minnesota's Supreme Court said it was not going to hear the case. Number three, the wife of the Gilgo Beach killing suspect is filing for divorce, according to her lawyer. You'll remember Rex Hewerman was charged with first-degree murder in the deaths of three women. He's also a suspect in the death of a fourth person. Prosecutors say Hewerman's wife's hair was found at at least one of the bodies, but she is not suspected of being involved at all. Number four, a Florida jury awarding $800,000 to the family of a girl who got second-degree burns from a chicken McNugget. Now, this case dates back to 2019 when a piping hot nugget fell onto a four-year-old's lap that happened as her mother was pulling out of the drive through This comes after a different jury found McDonald's and the franchise owner liable. Number five, a new study report reporting one thing that might help people stop biting their nails or picking their skin, gentle touch. Basically, just rubbing the fingertips or the palm or the back of your arm at least twice a day it's a technique called habit replacement. It's meant to help people swap out a bad habit with something that's harmless. About half the people in the study reported some improvement. Researchers say they need more data, but what they've seen so far apparently is pretty promising. There you go. When we come back, the new tech New York City is using to track people who skip out on paying subway fares. Plus, check this out, a rare catch. What made this fish blue? That's a little later in the local. There is one winning ticket for that billion dollar Powerball jackpot. We're going to tell you where that person, that lucky guy, bought it after a little bit later this hour. First, though, if you are a fan of the Washington Commanders, you'll want to hear this, this breaking in just the last half hour. Daniel Snyder is out and Josh Harris is in. You see Harris there with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, after the NFL owners unanimously approved the sale for $6 billion. Guys is part of who I am and who I've become as a person. But being a fan is not enough. At the same time, it welcomed Harris. The NFL also dropping a bombshell on Dan Snyder. He now faces a $60 million fine. That's after a years-long investigation into his conduct corroborates an, an allegation by a former cheerleader 
that he sexually harassed her and that he deliberated uh, under deliberately underreported revenue by the club to the NFL. Corey Robinson from NBC Sports joining us now to talk a little bit more about this. So, Corey, uh, walk us through more of what we're learning from, from this report uh, that looked into the commanders or what the, the report that came out after this investigation into the team. Yes, the SEC chair, Mary Jo White, led the 17-month-long investigation, over 10,000 documents. And basically, like you mentioned before, it's not just workplace misconduct. It's, there's also financial mismanagement, right? Then that then led to this idea of—or, sorry, this punishment of a $60 million fine on Mr. Snyder. This is interesting, though, Aaron, because if we go back to one of the early reports, and I have to say earlier because there have been many investigations on this team and on the Snyders particularly, but back in 2021, after attorney Beth Wilkinson's report, the NFL fined uh, Mr. Snyder $10 million, and he stepped away from day-to-day -day operations, and his wife took over uh, as the head of day-to-day -day operations for the club. So, Corey, I want to play a little bit of what Roger Goodell had to say about this report. We'll talk about it uh, after this. Listen. We had an obligation to, to release those publicly. Uh, we did. We shared those with the ownership today. Had a full discussion of that. Um, you know, that's the findings do speak for themselves. And, Corey, this report uh, sort of underscores, in some ways, why the league wanted to push Snyder out so badly, right? Uh, yeah, so, Aaron, this is so, this is interesting because the NFL is is almost invincible, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they basically survive any type of scandal and still make money. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. But in this instance, I think there was just too much, right? I mean, after three years of, of scandals, congressional investigations, the NFL doing multiple investigations, leveling multi, double-digit million-dollar fines, I think it got to the point where the rest of the NFL is, okay, we just got to move on past this. And then, most importantly, when you think about the playbook, it's the own... This is one of the best franchises in the league, in the world most valuable franchises in the world, you have to own a stadium. And quite frankly, Snyder wasn't able to do that because of all his baggage. And now this new group will be able to, that's probably the first thing they're going to do is build a new stadium, and that's good for the NFL. So I think that financial incentive was the thing that pushed it over as well, in addition to this. And, and unfortunately, Aaron, I think that's the truth. I don't think it's just the investigation, because quite frankly, I don't think that would be enough to just oust him out in the NFL. Yeah, you're going to have so many uh, long-suffering Washington football fans who are going to be looking to turn the page here and just move on to playing football and, and hopefully winning some games. As a Washington fan, I can say that. Corey Robinson, <laughs> we appreciate you. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks. Comic-Con kicking off today in San Diego. It looks a lot different, though, than what some fans are used to seeing. Normally, you'd have Hollywood A-listers involved in some of the biggest films of the year they're a big draw for these things, but this year, many of them are sitting out because of the ongoing actor strike. That means fewer panels, fewer interviews, a lot less promotion. Stars like Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Quinta Brunson, Keenan Thompson, they will not be there. But a different, slightly less star-filled atmosphere doesn't necessarily mean smaller or even less enthusiastic crowds. RJ Gray is in San Diego tonight. Hey, Aaron. Welcome to the opening session of Comic-Con. Take a look around. You can see this place is packed. Will it be different this year? Yeah, absolutely. But as you quickly learn here at Comic-Con, different doesn't necessarily mean bad. And, and there's nothing bad about this year. Over 130,000 people expected to be a part of the festival here. It seems to grow every year, and, and it's no different this year. No, there won't be the panels with the Hollywood stars, the writers, talking about the next story arc for your favorite villain or hero. But there is still plenty of to do, and of course the merchandise here and all of the memorabilia is the biggest draw that you'll see. Now, this is just day one of four days, so the crowd's expected to continue to grow. There is so much to see here, so much to do, and so much, frankly, to phone home about. And of course, as those crowds grow, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right, Aaron? Because the world never has enough superheroes. That's the latest premiere in San Diego. I throw it back to you, Aaron. NBC covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what we uh, here, here is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, we have a winner. Just one ticket had all the right numbers for that billion-dollar Powerball jackpot we've been telling you about. 
California Lottery said somebody bought it at a store in downtown Los Angeles, a convenience store there. Now, per state law, the winner's name has to be released when they come forward to claim the prize. From our Northeast Bureau, New York City using AI surveillance software to spot people evading subway fares. That's according to public documents and government contracts obtained by NBC News. Now, the city has been quietly rolling out this tech in some stations and is set to use it more by the end of the year. The transit authority saying the system does not flag fare evaders to New York police. A police spokesperson declined to comment. And from our Southern Bureau, we've been telling you about some crazy fish this week. Well, here's another one. This one caught in Virginia is super rare because its mouth is blue. You see it there. A state biologist says it got a, quote, wild genetic pigment mutation. And it's calling it a once in a lifetime catch. Blue fish. All right, stick around. Our Keir Simmons caught up with this guy who's big online for his train spotting. And Keir tried it out for himself to see what all the hype is about. We're going to bring that to you. Stick around. Time now to get to our backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight we're talking about train spotting. And in case you don't know what that is, it's basically standing on the side of the tracks, waving at the conductor, hoping they blow the horn as they pass. It gets real popular in the UK, apparently. That's thanks to one guy. He goes by Francois Bourgeois, Francis Bourgeois, I should say. He's blowing up big time on social media right now. More than 2 million Instagram followers, 3 million TikTok followers. People love him for, for this look he has, right? It's sort of a close-up, fish-eye look he gets from the GoPro that he mounts on his head there. And the pure sense of joy when he gets a response from the trains. Our Keir Simmons has more. Twenty-three-year-old Francis Bourgeois is known in the UK as a train spotter. He even uses a head-mounted camera to record his emotions, especially to trains that signal him as they pass. For me, it's about the, the feeling that it gives me. I'm looking for a fix. I'm looking for that exhilaration. <laughs> He's even been train spotting with Joe Jonas. Oh, what? oh my God! Whoa! <laughs> oh my God. And met William and Kate. Well, I was sitting down and I went hi, and then Kate thought I went hi and like go shake her hand. I broke so many protocols. And as we filmed, his fans wanted their own pictures. <laughs> the thing is, train spotting was not cool in Britain. Not even close. Not until Francis changed that conception. There was a kid that came up to me and he said, um, thank you so much because I'm no longer bullied at school anymore. And he looked at me and he went, and I, and I looked at him and I started crying and I gave him a hug. And I looked around and other people on the train were crying. You know, in a way I've kind of helped my younger self, you know. Together, we went train spotting. Oh, look, what's that? That's a class 08 shunter with a 92. That's really nice. Train spotting actually takes a lot of commitment. I've done sort of 14, 16 hours before. For a day? Yeah. Wow. Because you often have to wait for the train you want to see. And wait. And wait. But finally, we were ready for a unique experience, wearing Francis's trademark 360 head cameras. Am I allowed to say I feel a little bit silly? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Turns out train spotting has some pretty strict rules. Yeah. Only wave with one hand and not too much. Just like a hello, like that. And that it's a roller coaster of emotion. All right, here it comes. Oh, it's properly going for it. Anyway. Cheers! <laughs> oh. <laughs> there we go. For Francis, who's even written a book, having his passion accepted is the greatest high of all. You're part of letting people know yeah. that it's okay. 
Letting people know that it's okay to be different. Ideally, everyone should be accepting of one another, especially in schools. I'd, I'd like there to be a change in awareness that people who are different should be accepted and even celebrated. Keir Simmons, NBC News. And even celebrate it, for sure. Keir Simmons, thank you for that. And stay tuned for our next hour when Keir will join us live for the backstory on his conversation with Francis. That is a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. We are coming on the air with this global heat wave turning deadly now. New reports of a man who died in a California national park as hospitals in Europe brace for what they're calling a week of hell. We're live outside Miami where millions are under heat alerts today. Also new tonight, family members of the U.S. soldier now in North Korean custody saying that they are worried about his fate after he ran across the border. What we're learning about how he got there in the first place. Then, a former aide to former President Donald Trump testifying today before the special counsel's grand jury. But he's not someone the January 6th committee was interested in talking to. So why is Jack Smith? Plus, our team is getting an exclusive look at the search warrant Nevada police used to search a home they say is connected to the murder of Tupac, how it fits into the investigation. And more on that breaking news, the $60 million fine for now former Washington Commander's owner Daniel Snyder right after he sold the team. What this huge report into his conduct just out, just uh, later on in the show. Hey, everybody, I'm Aaron in for Halle today. And tonight, this never-ending scorching heat wave is now expanded to include Northern California as the heat becomes even more deadly. A man in his 70s died in a, in a, at a trailhead in Death Valley National Park as temperatures soared above 120 degrees. Officials think it's heat-related, making it the second death there this summer. We're also learning about a woman who was arrested for the death of a 10-month-old after she left the infant in a car. That was in Florida. The child was in the car for hours, the temperature inside that vehicle reaching 133 degrees. From coast to coast now, nearly 90 million people are under heat alerts today, with more records expected to be broken after more than two dozen were smashed yesterday. And in North Carolina, people are starting to pick up the pieces after that tornado we told you about tore through a community there, ripping off roofs, knocking down power lines. The National Weather Service now saying it was an EF3, upgraded from an EF2. It was on the ground across almost 17 miles, about 30 minutes and overseas, Southern Europe also can't seem to catch a break from the blazing sun. Another heat wave starting there today. Italian officials and hospitals seeing a jump in emergencies. Local media there describing it as a week of hell. And in Greece, wildfires raging through the country's forests, burning through houses, forcing people to evacuate. Italy, France, Romania, Poland, Slovakia, all sending either planes or firefighters to help battle the flames there. We have meteorologist Bill Karens on all of this for us. First, let's go to Marissa Parra in Coral Gables, Florida, talking about the heat we're seeing now. Marissa, it's been more than a month of these temperatures in the Miami area where you are. Talk to us about what it's like there, how people are dealing with the, dealing with the heat there days on end. Yeah, well, I mean, as you mentioned, it's not just here in Florida that we're seeing the heat. It really is coast to coast. But I can speak from experience, having been in both Phoenix, Arizona, as well as now the Miami area here in Florida. Um, certainly a whole lot less people out and about in both areas. Phoenix, it was like no one was out. And here, there's just people taking a little bit more precautions. But, you know, something that I think is interesting and maybe doesn't get talked about quite as much is the impact this heat has on animals as well, because it's not just humans that are subject to it. So I saw firsthand at the Phoenix Zoo how they were trying to spray down the animals, make sure they were staying cool, giving them popsicles and frozen treats. But also, we caught up with a woman here in Coral Gables with what she was doing, the precautions she was taking to make sure that her furry friend was safe in the heat. Listen for yourself. We walk here every day to the store, but I never let him touch the pavement because if I, if I wouldn't walk on it, I don't want him to walk on it. So, but it's, it's brutal. 
That is one loving pet owner, and she is right. It is brutal out here. We're talking about 40 straight days of temperatures with a heat index over triple digits here in Miami. And listen, we've said this before. We'll say it again. It's not just uncomfortable. It is dangerous. And we have seen that from coast to coast, how dangerous it can get, whether it's the heat index or the straight up temps in triple digits. And unfortunately, we did just learn that just yesterday, a woman was arrested in charge because there was an infant who died after being left in inside of a hot vehicle. We're talking about 133 degrees. That infant that was left inside by the woman that you see on the screen, he had an he had an internal body temperature of 110 degrees. I mean, that is fatal. And unfortunately, we're seeing that also from coast to coast, people with critically high body temperatures. So I'll leave you with this, Erin. Again, just how dangerous this can get. When we talk about extreme weather, heat is the most dangerous and deadly form of extreme weather. So just make sure to take those precautions, hydrate, and get inside to air conditioning if you can. There are cooling shelters that are open around these areas that are affected most, Erin. Yeah, some really good advice there, Marissa. We appreciate your reporting. We'll give you and your crew a chance to get inside now and get some air conditioning. Thank you. Let's get to meteorologist Bill Cairns now. Bill, uh, Marissa laid it out nicely, the heat situation that we're seeing here in the U.S., but Europe is also dealing with something similar, right? Yeah, they have their own heat dome and heat wave that they're dealing with. It's mostly been southern Europe. We haven't heard a lot this summer about heat waves in London like we did last year where they had the record-breaking heat. So we have our heat dome over the southern U.S., and then we have our heat dome that has established itself over northern Africa, and it's extended across the Mediterranean, especially southern portions of Italy and also here around Greece. It's not exactly uh, enjoyable either in northern Egypt. So as far as the temperatures go, you have to remember, now they're up towards midnight in many areas here in Europe. So this is cooling off. So they're still in in the 80s in many spots, even Rome. Uh, after daytime highs today, we're in the 90s. A few spots did hit 100 in southern Italy and also here in southern Greece, right now 86. Tomorrow is going to be another hot day, but especially southern portions of Greece and Turkey. Uh, Athens, 102 Friday, Saturday up to 104. Southern Italy, similar, upper 90s to 100. And you have to remember, if you're near the Mediterranean too, it's very warm and very humid. Bill, there's also some severe weather that we're, we're talking about, right? The possibility for that this evening here in the, in the States. Yeah, this is on the heels of yesterday's tornado and that flash flood event in Kentucky. And right now we have significant flash flooding taking place in central and west, eastern portions of Tennessee. And as far as severe weather goes, we're going to have to watch Detroit towards Cleveland. Detroit, I think your threat is just about over with, but we still have to deal with storms going through Cleveland to Pittsburgh to Buffalo. Wind damage is possible. We have one area of approaching Atlanta, too. So any flights down there, that's going to be huge delays as a severe thunderstorm warning is now in effect for the northern half of the city of Atlanta. All right, Bill Karras for us tonight. Bill, thank you. Let's take you overseas now where we are getting new details about the American soldier in custody in North Korea after he bolted across the border with South Korea into one of the most volatile regions anywhere in the world. This is kind of a bizarre story, right? Some members of Travis King's family now saying they are worried about him and the fate that he may endure there in North Korea. Watch. I think his problem is that he need help. You know, that's not Travis. Uh, out of his character, I've never seen him get down like that ever. So something must. So be. something's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. This isn't him. It's not his personality. Now we're also starting to learn more about the 23-year-old's last months in South Korea. A South Korean official telling us he spent 48 days in prison there, being released earlier this month. He was supposed to come back to the U.S. when he got out, but. He didn't have all the documents he needed to actually get on a plane. Instead, King got away from military officials at the airport and ended up with a tour group headed to the border. He sprinted across the border to the shock, really, of the tourists who were around him. Our Matt Bradley has more now from Seoul. Yes, we just got some troubling new details about the events that led up to this young private mad dash across the border into North Korea. Now, we knew that he was implicated or at least had been detained or accused of at least one, possibly two different assaults at two different nightclubs or bars. Now, we also know that he was serving detention in a South Korean prison while he was working or while he was enlisted in the U.S. military here in South Korea. Now, he decided to spend 48 days, and right after that was when he decided to make his mad dash across the border. Now, what that was was not a separate, yet another third assault. It turns out that he was deciding he made a choice to go to prison and spend 48 days there in lieu of paying a fine 
for damaging a police car. And that was an altercation that occurred while he was being detained by police during one of those two previous assaults. So basically, this young man decided that instead of paying the $5,000 fine, he would do what some South Koreans are able to do, which is to spend 48 days in prison, essentially doing labor. And once he was released on July 10th, that was when, a, a week later, he joined a guided tour, went to the border, and decided to make that very treacherous uh, move across the border, one that has now exploded into an international diplomatic crisis. Now, we've also heard from U.S. officials today. My, part, uh, my colleague, Courtney Kuby, interviewed the Secretary of the Army, and she said that it turns out that the United States has had no real direct contact with anyone in North Korea, despite efforts to try to contact the North Koreans through the United Nations, through the South Koreans, and through the Swedish embassy in Pyongyang. And the fact is, is that we're not going to know anything more about the fate of this young soldier, Private Travis King, before we hear from the North Koreans. And right now, the overwhelming sound we're hearing from North Korea is silence on this troubling matter. Matt Bradley in South Korea for us tonight. Uh, we want to turn now back here to Washington and a close aide of former President Donald Trump, who may have unique insights on the days after Trump lost the 2020 election. He's testifying today before a federal grand jury. We're talking about William Russell here. You see him here on Mr. Trump's left just moments before he spoke to the crowd of supporters who would go on to launch that deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol. So here's what we know about Russell at this point. He is a former White House aide who helped organize the former president's trips. He is still in the Trump circle and is working for his 2024 campaign. He's also already testified more than once before Jack Smith's grand jury. But... And this is what's really interesting at this point. Russell is not mentioned a single time in the January 6th committee's final report. Garrett Hake joins me now. So the January 6th committee didn't mm -hmm. want to talk to Russell, but... Jack Smith's grand jury wants to hear from him. What do we know about why that is? Well, look, it's a reminder that the federal government has powers to compel testimony that the January 6th committee lacked and that they were able to go deeper with lots of folks. I mean, look, Russell is a relatively junior aide or was in the Trump White House. But as that picture demonstrates, he's somebody who has a personal aide to the president would have had close proximity to him. So maybe he's somebody who overheard something. Maybe he's somebody whose version of events contradicts that of another witness. That's the kind of thing that might explain why he keeps getting called to testify over and over and over again. He's been hard to track down. He hasn't appeared in public, but he is still in the Trump inner circle. So he knows something of value to these prosecutors. And I guess we're all going to find out together if and when there's an indictment. Yeah, eventually we'll see, right? I understand that uh, the special counsel also spoke with Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, look, this is another one that's not surprising that it happened. It's just a matter of nailing down the details. Giuliani was kind of the godfather of the whole stop the steal movement. We knew that from the January 6th committee to be sure. This is somebody who was in the president's ear all the time saying you ought to fight this. He was filing lawsuits. He was traveling the country talking about these issues. He was a central figure. We learned that he talked to investigators back sometime in the early spring in New York City. What's interesting to me is are they talking to him as a witness or are they talking to him as somebody who they think might also potentially face charges? Again, we don't know the answers to those questions yet, but he has not received a target letter, at least as of right now. And since that last target letter went to the former president, we're what, five a little after five o'clock on mm -hmm. Thursday. So he's not going to speak to the grand jury here in D.C. Um, at the same time, he's asking the House to, to sort of remove the impeachments from his record, right? That's right. And it's not really a power that the House has. They can vote on what's called an expungement, but it doesn't do anything. The I mean, impeachments happen, right? I mean, you can pass a resolution that says basically anything you want, but nothing will take away the fact that we all lived through those two impeachments. That said, uh, my sources say Donald Trump is enamored of this idea. He wants to see the House take a vote on it. He wants the House leaders, particularly Kevin McCarthy, to be more vocal about it. Uh, but the oldest rule in Congress is if you have the votes, you take the votes. And what it tells me is House Republicans don't have a majority yet to make this happen, regardless of how much Donald Trump might want it. All right. So many more moves to see uh, in this case. Uh, Garrett Hake, we appreciate the reporting. Thanks. You bet. And fireworks today at a Republican-led House committee hearing. It's centered around testimony from 2024 Democratic presidential hopeful Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Now, Democrats taking the opportunity here to torch the potential spoiler candidate. That hearing held by a committee focused on the so-called weaponization of the government with today's focus on censorship in America. Democrats using their time to go after a man known for conspiracy theories and potentially siphoning votes away from President Biden. Listen. 
There's no secret that this is an amplification of his own platform. One of our Republican witnesses encourages this appalling rhetoric and promotes anti-Asian hate with dangerous and unfounded claims. Extreme mega Republicans elevate a man who tells others that vaccines aren't safe. Now, Kennedy's gotten a ton of backlash in recent days from folks on both sides of the aisle after he implied that the COVID pandemic was somehow designed to spare certain Jews and Chinese people, which he says was taken out of context. NBC's Ali Vitale joins me now. What's the, the undercurrent here, right? Did Republicans really want to hear from RFK Jr. on this particular topic? What was the motivation as you understand it? Yeah. It's a really good question because certainly he's not the first person to have his accounts disabled because he spread, in this case, misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine on his Instagram page. But nevertheless, he is the person that Republicans on the House Weaponization Select Committee decided to put forward as a key witness here. Of course, one of the things that that allowed them to do is to spotlight the fact that this is a man, Robert Kennedy Jr., who Democrats would prefer to ignore. And of course, there's a certain irony to having that man be the central witness at a hearing about censorship. But the other piece of it was really just being able to use a Democrat to kind of troll Democrats. But frankly, most of this hearing did not focus in Democrats questioning Kennedy regarding censorship. Instead, it was a lot about past comments like the ones that you just referenced. Listen. Do you think it was just as hard to wear a mask during COVID as it was to hide under floorboards or false walls so you weren't murdered or dragged to a concentration camp? Of course not. That is okay. ridiculous. But that's a comparison that you made. And if this were a slip of the tongue, Mr. Kennedy, or a one-off comment, we would all move on. But there's a deeply disturbing pattern. There were several other exchanges like that, Aaron, with Democratic members pushing Kennedy on statements that he's made and then tried to explain away. He continued to do that in front of this committee. And again, it was just another example of how Republicans are using the power of the gavel here to really give a lot of red meat to their base. Censorship and big tech is something that Republicans have talked about a lot. It fits into that narrative of the culture wars, but then also the fact that they are doing it with Biden's really only, aside from from Marianne Williamson, Democratic challenger. I think that was sort of an added benefit to a committee that really does like to push the envelope. Yeah, very quickly, though, on the Democrat side, what do you think was, was going on here for them? What about the strategy from House Democrats that we saw today showing up to the hearings full force, really, versus what we saw with Republicans and the January 6th committee, where most of them refused to join? What do you make of it? Yeah. Lessons learned. Think about the ways that a lot of the criticism of the January 6th committee's work from the Republican side was that there were no Republicans there to rebut it in real time. It's what made the January 6th committee such a fascinating and frankly difficult to replicate select committee because all of the members, Republican and Democrat alike, were marching in lockstep on pushing the same narrative using the same evidence to drive at the same points. That's not how most congressional hearings actually work. Typically, you watch the ping pong between Republican talking points than Democratic talking points and on and on. That's what we saw today. And it's really Democrats taking a cue from Republicans who stonewalled the January 6th committee and wouldn't participate by and large unless you had the two Republicans, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, who, of mm. course, were of the same mindset on January 6th. Instead, what we're watching here is Democrats learning that lesson and rebutting in real time, much in the same way that we see them do in most normal congressional hearings. Ali Vitale for us on the Hill tonight. Ali, thank you. The murder of rapper Tupac making headlines again. NBC News today first to obtain a search warrant. Las Vegas Metro Police served on a home, giving us more details into exactly what they were looking for. According to that warrant, on Monday, police searched the home of Dwayne Keith Davis. Now, police have previously said he was in the suspected shooter's car when Tupac was killed. That was nearly 30 years ago. Police found a USB drive, an iPhone, some iPads, and laptops, among other things. Remember, Tupac died at the age of 25 after being shot during a drive-by in Las Vegas in 1996. There has never been an arrest in this case. So let's go to Kristen Dahlgren now for more on this. Uh, so, Kristen, what do we know about the man whose house was searched, and, and what do we know about, you know, how this all connects, what it tells us about the investigation? 
Right. So much interest in this one, Aaron. So we're talking about the home of 60-year-old uh, Keefe D, as he's known. He has been vocal over the years uh, about his involvement in the case. Police say that his nephew is the alleged shooter, Orlando Anderson. Anderson denied involvement and was never charged in the case. He died in a gang-related killing in 1998. Uh, so Davis has given police info on this case as part of a limited prosecution agreement. Uh, of the four people believed to be in the shooter's car that night, he is the only survivor. The others have all died uh, or been killed. And so the hope is that he might be able to lead police to some type of resolution in this case. He could be key in finding answers. Uh, from that search warrant, it's very clear that they were looking at two things. They were looking at his digital footprint, so they took laptops, iPads, um, and things like that. And then they're also looking at some statements he may have made or things he may have kept. And so there were also these uh, books and articles on Tupac that he kept as well. Those were seized also, Aaron. You know, you mentioned it, right? I mean, it's been almost 30 years since Tupac was killed. We know that uh, the, the main suspect in that is dead now. What's driving the, the renewed interest? Right. So definitely uh, some type of resolution. A lot of people looking for closure as far as this case goes, having been open for so many years and garnered such intense interest. And then there is this, you know, mythical being who is Tupac and over the years has grown even in fame, uh, has significant um, you know, music cred, six Grammy nominations, five number one albums. He sold 33 million albums. He was uh, nominated and, and accepted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and also a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame just this past June. And so really just intense interest in him over the years and uh, in solving this case, Aaron. Yeah, interest that uh, never will never go away, I, I, I would imagine, as a lot of people still love his music, and, and there's this mystery, too. Kristen Dahlgren for us. Thank you, Kristen. You bet. Let's take you to New Zealand now, where the U.S. women's soccer team getting ready to defend their title with their first match kicking off tomorrow night. The tournament started today with the two host countries, New Zealand and Australia. They won their first matches. That's less than 24 hours after that deadly shooting in a busy area near where fans and the teams are staying in Auckland, New Zealand. New Zealand's prime minister telling people today that it is safe to go to the World Cup. Watch. I will be going. It is safe to go. Um, and we and, you know, continue to encourage the Auckland community to get behind this event. Let's bring in Molly Hunter, live now in Auckland for us. Uh, Molly, the U.S. team is going to try to claim this third World Cup crown. Uh, what can we expect to see from the team tomorrow night? Hey, Aaron, that's right. They are gunning for a three-peat, something no, no man's team, men's team or women's team has ever done in a World Cup. Of course, the U.S. are the defending champs. They've won the last two. But this team is different than the 2019 squad, Aaron. Fourteen players on this squad have never seen World Cup action. We actually sat down with co-captain Alex Morgan. Of course, at age 35, she is a veteran heading into her fourth World Cup. Take a quick listen to what she told me about the expectations. We do set expectations for ourselves. We do want to find ourselves at the end. We do mm -hmm. want to be hoisting the trophy at the end. To get there is a long way. Now, Aaron, I asked her about the generational divide of the team, and we've been spending some time with some of the players. They call it from age 18 to Pino. Of course, Megan Rapino is the veteran player, superstar forward. She is retiring after this tournament, and at 38, she's the oldest player. I asked them kind of what the locker room chat was like, who got to choose the music on the bus. Definitely <laughs> Megan's music choices, no matter what. But Alex also said, look, it doesn't matter if you're 18, you're 25, or you're 30. If you can hang, you can hang, and they'll have the best squad out there tomorrow night. And so many people watching and cheering them on all over the world. Molly, I, I want to sort of get a little bit of a, a vibe check from you, if we can. Obviously, we're talking about <laughs> the world's most popular sport. What's the excitement like there in New Zealand right now? 
Yeah, Erin, it's the world's most popular sport, and certainly this is the biggest women's world event, sporting event in the world. I got to say, though, and we've been in New Zealand all week, this is rugby country. People here are mad rugby fans, not so much soccer fans. So they are seeing kind of huge attendance levels and record-setting attendance levels for what they're used to. They packed the Eden Park Stadium. That's the stadium in Auckland where their home team played last night. 40,000, that's the most people who have ever watched a soccer game. And Erin, we were at a bar just right here last night when both New Zealand, the host country, and Australia Australia, the other host country were playing. Huge excitement, lots of really excited fans. And for New Zealand, the Ferns, that's what the team is called, beat Norway 1-0. That's the first win for a New Zealand soccer team in the World Cup, men's or women's, ever. So I think vibe check, high, excitement, high. They have sold nearly 1.4 million tickets for the entire tournament, and that's much higher than the last Women's World Cup, Aaron. Wow, yeah, big deal for sure. We're going to be watching closely to see the uh, U.S. team advance as well this weekend. Molly Hunter for us, live in New Zealand uh, tonight here, tomorrow morning there. Molly, thank you. <laughs> All right, a lot more ahead in the show tonight. North Dakota police saying a man who ambushed them could have done way more damage. That's later in the five things. First, though, the new head of the CDC speaking to NBC News what she sees as the biggest challenges on the road ahead. Now we want to bring you tonight's Newsmaker exclusive. Our health and medical reporter, Erica Edwards, spoke one-on-one -on -one with the new CDC director, Dr. Mandy Cohen. It's her first sit-down interview since starting that position less than two weeks ago now. She's taking the reins at a critical time, with the CDC going through some massive internal changes, and Americans' trust in that agency is at an all-time low. Here's the story. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, once considered the gold standard of public health, finds itself at a crossroads. It's time for a new chapter. Trust in the CDC plummeted during the height of the pandemic. Presidential candidates continue to slam the agency. We've seen over the past few years uh, really the, the bankruptcy uh, of the public health establishment. From both sides of the aisle. The CDC, the World Health Organization, the, the National those Academy organizations of Sciences. are captive agencies. Vaccine misinformation, surges in drug overdoses, unprecedented gun deaths, all considered major issues the CDC must tackle, even amid a proposed funding cut of more than a billion dollars. This is what Dr. Mandy Cohen faces Mark. as she takes the helm of the agency. Why did you want this job? <laughs> I have dedicated my career to making impact in the health space. And so when an opportunity to lead an agency whose mission is to protect the health of this country and really the world, that was an easy answer. It was yes. First on her long list of goals, rebuilding credibility lost because of some CDC missteps during the pandemic. If we want to protect the health of every American, we have to first make sure that we are building trust with the American people. And I know some of that trust was lost in the last few years. But I'm here to refocus the organization on building that trust. How will you do that differently, though, from your predecessors? Is that engaging press briefings more? How, how will you get that message out to people who really need to hear that? Well, first, it starts with the whole team at CDC. Trust is not just built with me uh, doing something different. It's all of us being different. Um, and at my first all-hands meeting here at CDC last week, the first thing we talked about was trust. And Cohen might just be able to do it because of her experience speaking to the public and politicians. As Health Secretary of North Carolina, Cohen, a Democrat, helped convince conservatives to expand Medicaid in the state. And she was the face of daily state-run COVID briefings. Do you know your three W's? Wear, wait, wash? Whose down-to-earth guidance was met with little political pushback. Those are going to be really important skills as you face budget cuts, how are you going to handle that moving forward with Washington? I want to make sure that they know me, um, how I operate, how we can work together. I want to make sure I know what's on their mind because, look, they're the ones that are investing behind the CDC. On Wednesday, Cohen was on Capitol Hill meeting with both Democrats and Republicans. This is a bipartisan issue to make sure that our country is safe and protected. 
Beyond politics, she's facing the very real impact of climate change on Americans' health, from extreme heat to air pollution from wildfires, even threatening to add new viruses to the mix, which Cohen says the CDC is tracking closely. Look, we saw for the first time a few cases of domestically acquired malaria, um, which we hadn't seen in 20 years. On a scale of 1 to 10, how concerned should Americans be about malaria? You should not be concerned at all. So right now, you should not be concerned at all. I'm worrying about it for you. <laughs> but that's not all that worries Cohen. What do you think is the biggest threat to public health right now that we face? The thing that I am most worried about is this broken, broken trust. For us to be strong as a nation, we need to make sure that we trust each other. And, and that's, that's about public health, but it's about so much more than that. Unfortunately, in the United States, life expectancy is actually going down. You know, for such a rich and prosperous country, for our life expectancy to be going down, we really need to take a hard look to say, like, well, how can we do better? For Cohen, doing better starts with her new co-workers, even as she's still learning her way around the building. Sometimes I'll just go to a random floor in one of the buildings and I'll just wander around and pop into a meeting. <laughs> Her very first day on the job, greeting employees at the door with Alicia Keys songs playing in the background, all part of her plan to get the CDC on board with her goals. One of my values that I bring here to work um, is joy, right? We want to have joy at work, and that's not just about parties and celebrations, but it's about connecting with the mission. But you need to have a little fun at work in order to bring your A-game. Um, I really think the American people deserve the everyone's a game they deserve my best and they deserve the best from this agency erica edwards joins us now erica some really good insights into how this new director is going to operate and how she thinks there are a lot of big public health issues right now for the country to be focused on you talked about so many of the issues what did she say about gun violence about the mental health crisis in this country Hey, Aaron. Yeah, so Dr. Cohen did not address gun violence directly, but she did say that it's the CDC's role to collect data and research about the public health impact of guns. That way, legislatures and indeed the American public can make informed decisions about the issues based on science. We also talked extensively about mental health. As you know, the CDC recently came out with several really concerning reports about rises in rates of depression and sadness, especially among girls. Dr. Cohen herself has two young daughters and she says that the CDC can't work alone in solving the mental health crisis. It's going to take a big collaboration between public health officials, doctors um, and young families, even schools. I did want to bring up, I did ask her about another controversial topic, abortion. She said that it is the CDC's duty to make sure that all women have access to health care whenever they need it. And she said that abortion is a form of medical care. Erin. All right, Erica Edwards for us. Great interview. Erica, thank you in Atlanta tonight. Thanks. All right, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, officials are releasing new details about a gunman who ambushed three North Dakota police officers, killing one and hurting the other two. They're now saying the whole thing could have been way worse. That shooter had 1,800 rounds of ammunition and a homemade hand grenade. Officials said the man fired a rifle from inside his vehicle in an unprovoked attack. Police shot and killed the gunman. Number two, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is going to ask the Supreme Court to review his conviction and the murder of George Floyd. That's according to his lawyer, who said the court needs to look at whether Chauvin was denied a fair trial. This comes after Minnesota's Supreme Court said it was not going to hear the case. Number three, the wife of the Gilgo Beach killings suspect is filing for divorce, according to her lawyer. You'll remember Rex Hewerman was charged with first-degree murder in the deaths of three women, and he is a suspect in the death of a fourth person. Prosecutors say that Hewerman's wife's hair was found at, on at least one of the bodies, but they do not suspect she was involved. Number four, Tesla's recalling almost 16,000 Model S and Model X vehicles because of a seatbelt problem. It said flaws in the front row seatbelts could mean they may not work right in a crash. U.S. safety officials started looking into Tesla's seatbelts a few months ago. If you are affected, you will, get a, you will get a letter in the mail from Tesla. And number five, a new study shows one thing that may help people stop biting their nails or picking their skin. 
gentle touch, it's called. Basically just rubbing the fingertips or palms or back of the arm at least twice a day, apparently. It's a technique called habit replacement. It's meant to stop or rather help people swap out a bad habit for something less harmful. About half the people in the study reported some improvement. Researchers say they need more data, but what they've seen so far is promising. Coming up, why now is the perfect time for a blockbuster movie about Robert Oppenheimer's life, according to his biographer. That's later in tonight's original. Pop star Shakira is not out of the woods with Spanish police. We'll tell you why. First, though, big news for fans of the Washington Commanders. Breaking in just the last hour or so, Daniel Snyder is out. Josh Harris is in. You see Harris there with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. That's after NFL owners unanimously approved the sale of the team for $6 billion. This franchise is part of who I am and who I've become as a person. But being a fan is not enough. Now, at the same time it welcomed Harris, the NFL also dropping a bombshell on Dan Snyder. He now faces a $60 million fine after a years-long investigation into his conduct corroborates an allegation by a former cheerleader that he sexually harassed her and that he deliberately underreported revenue by the club to the NFL. Corey Robinson from NBC Sports joining us now to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Corey, walk us through more of what we're learning from this report about the commanders. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, so this was a 17-month-long 17 17 investigation that former SEC Chair Mary Jo White conducted. But the, over 10,000 different documents, 44 witnesses, and it goes down to those two major points. Uh, the workplace misconduct, particularly that one, um, that one instance of sexual harassment with uh, Ms. Johnston, um, and then this financial misreporting, there about $11 million worth of revenue that um, they were able to confirm and sustain that the team did not share with the rest of the NFL. Uh, this is... In addition, <laughs> this is a crazy thing. A couple of years ago, uh, attorney Beth Wilkinson, in an independent th uh, review of the team, they found that they were the team also had financial misconduct and workplace har harassment, which then led to a $10 million fine, which was a record then. And then two years later, we have an, a 6X of this fine, which is just incredible. Yeah, incredible indeed. I, I want to play a little bit of what Roger Goodell had to say about the report earlier today. L listen to this. We had an obligation to, to release those publicly. Uh, we did. We shared those with the ownership today. Had a full discussion of that. Um, you know, that's the findings do speak for themselves. And so, Corey, we have this report now that sort of underscores part of the reason the league wanted to push Snyder out and is ready, it would seem like so many people are, to close this chapter for this football team. The, yeah, the, I, the, uh, the, the, the Snyder chapter. Yeah, absolutely, Aaron, because the, the Washington Commanders are one of the most valuable franchises for the league, right? And it's not healthy for the league when one of the most valuable franchises is not only not good, but also going through so it's just embroiled in so many issues, not just, I mean, there's multiple investigations on multiple levels, federal, local, NFL. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So th to think that they had two record-setting fines in two years on the same owner, th this is just, I mean, like I said, it's incredible that it took this long, but... For Washington fans, it's a nice step forward that they finally can get this past them and hopefully bring this franchise back uh, to where it needs to be. Because if it's in a good place, that's good for the NFL. And I think that's what the NFL finally realized, that this is not good for all of us. Yeah, all of us long-suffering uh, Washington football fans are excited about the next chapter, moving on here and hopefully winning uh, some titles. Corey Robinson, appreciate you. Thanks. Well, coming up, a lioness on the loose, putting people on high alert, but not where you'd think, though. That's a little bit later in the global. Up next, though, we are talking about one of TikTok, TikTok's most popular and most unlikely influencers, a guy who watches trains. Stick around. It is time to get the backstory, our behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we are talking about train spotting. In case you don't know what that means, it is basically standing on the side of the tracks, waving at the conductor, hoping they blow the horn as they pass by. It's getting really popular in the UK, and that is thanks to this guy. He goes by Francis Bourgeois. He is blowing up 
big time on social media right now. We're talking about 2 million Instagram followers, 3 million TikTok followers. People love this guy for this look. You see this right here, this sort of close-up, kind of fisheye look that he gets from the GoPro. This is mounted on his head. And then there's this just pure joy when he gets a response from one of the trains going by. Now, he's gotten to shake hands with uh, William and Kate. You see that right there. Joe Jonas actually did some train spotting with him. And now, so has our own Keir Simmons, who spent the day with Francis, getting to witness a, a day in the life, if you will, which included a lot of waiting at this train station, as happens sometimes. But finally, he put on the GoPro himself. And Keir Simmons joins me now. You know, this makes me think, Keir, about when I was a kid, it was about the big trucks, the 18-wheelers the, the going by, and you would do this to try to get the uh, truck driver to blow the horn. Th yeah. It's hard to deny that excitement, right? Did you expect to feel that rush when you got that horn blow? I didn't expect to, and I did a little bit. I mean, as you can tell, I'm not a kid anymore, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it was an amazing experience, and it, it was kind of unique in that way because I didn't expect to be to enjoy it so much. I mean, folks who've who've watched in the, the last hour will have seen the whole the whole report where you really get to hear Francis just infectious laugh on his Instagram. You look at you watch his reports, and you know, and you just can't help smiling. And that was a bit of what it was like, you know, with him. But I will say something else too, which I love about him. He's just so awkward. Uh, you know, when he met <laughs> William and Kate, who are also, let's be honest, royal, so they're quite awkward. Yeah. It was a very, very awkward encounter, and someone on Instagram commented underneath, this is the most English thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and you know. we can all really appreciate it. I mean, you just, it's, it's these experiences that just sort of joy and the, the randomness of, of some of these yeah. encounters. You don't uh, expect really cool it. You, know, you, do, you do not expect to go train spotting and enjoy it. You do yeah. not. <laughs> and yet I did. So, well, good. We're, go we're glad you did. We could, we could tell you did. You know, at the same time, this is something... You know, journalists don't always get to do this sort of, you know, step-into-your-shoes kind of reporting, right? Yeah, I you do, actually... though. I, I seem to get those assignments a lot. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Someone's got it in for me. Uh, so, but, yeah. but did you feel like, in this particular case, like, that was the, the, the best way to do this, the most effective way to tell Francis' story? Well, I mean, yes, I, honestly. I think yeah. often for a journalist, kind of going on the journey and, and, and seeing for yourself is really the point, right? Whether it's with somebody like Francis or whether it is kind of going to a place that other folks haven't been to. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Up front, by the way, you know, Francis is an Maybe folks watching who know Francis Bourgeois will know that, you know, he's a pretty effective storyteller himself. I mean, yeah. he's amazing at communicating. I mean, I love the way that he communicates his joy and his uh, uniqueness, if you like. I mean, look at those numbers, you know. Uh, the <laughs> two of us standing... Suit. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> we've got a still of the two of us standing together. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, ultimately... Uh, people are going to say, uh, yeah, there we are. There so, every, it's, yeah, people seeing that would say, I know the guy on the left. Who's the guy on the right? I mean, he's <laughs> he's a big deal, Francis yeah. Bourgeois. Well, given that fact, I mean, obviously, we talk about his social media presence. It is huge. People yeah. know him, know so much about him, the folks yeah. who follow him. What do you think people who follow him every day might not know about him or might not understand about who he is and why he has this, this passion for trains? Yeah, his name isn't Francis. How about that? His okay. name isn't Francis. <laughs> and I love this story. Um, he is actually Luke. He called himself Francis at the beginning because he didn't want people, to, people, employers, for example, to know about what he does, right? And yet, of course, now the whole world knows what he does. And what that tells you, and what I just love about this, is that this guy who felt awkward and f didn't feel great about his passion now feels great about his passion. Other young people who also love trains now feel great about that too. And isn't it a joy to hear a positive thing about social media that it enables folks to be accepted? Uh, to have Fans were coming up to say hi. I mean, you know, people shaking with excitement to meet him. I, I, that is such a blessing for us yeah. that um, it's possible for maybe people who weren't accepted to be accepted. Yeah. Such a cool story on so many levels. Kier, we appreciate you uh, 
uh, sharing the story with us last hour and talking to us about it this hour. Yeah, great story. Thank you, sir. You bet. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our foreign desk has done it for you. We call this segment The Global from Argentina. Take a look at this. A woman crossing the street just barely missed a, by a car crash there. You saw the two cars collide there and then shoot in opposite directions. The woman there in the middle, she's just sort of covered herself with her hands, as any of us would think to do. Officials say that nobody was seriously hurt here, believe it or not. Out of Germany, a lion may be on the loose there. There is the uh, police trying to track it down. You see it there after getting a report of a big cat chasing a wild boar. Officials think it's an escaped pet, actually. They're telling people to stay inside. And from Spain, Shakira is facing another investigation. The court said today it's going to look into a second case of alleged tax fraud. Shakira is already set to go to trial for allegedly failing to pay millions in taxes. Her spokesperson told NBC News she's, quote, confident that there will be a favorable resolution. All right, still to come this hour, what's a Comic-Con like without super star power? The impact of that actor strike in full force next. Comic-Con kicking off today in San Diego, but it's going to look a lot different than what fans are used to seeing. Normally, you'd have these Hollywood A-listers involved in some of the biggest films of the year. They're a big draw for Comic-Con, right? Well, this year, a lot of them are sitting out because of the ongoing actor strike. That means fewer panels, fewer interviews, less promotion. Stars like Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Quinta Brunson, Kenan Thompson, they're not going to be there. But a different, slightly less star-filled atmosphere doesn't necessarily mean smaller or even less th enthusiastic crowds. RJ Gray is in San Diego for us tonight. Hey, Aaron. Welcome to the opening session of Comic-Con. Take a look around. You can see this place is packed. Will it be different this year? Yeah, absolutely. But as you quickly learn here at Comic-Con, different doesn't necessarily mean bad. And, and there's nothing bad about this year. Over 130,000 people expected to be a part of the festival here. It seems to grow every year, and, and it's no different this year. No, there won't be the panels with the Hollywood stars, the writers, talking about the next story arc for your favorite villain or hero. But there is still plenty of to do, and of course, the merchandise here and all of the memorabilia is the biggest draw that you'll see. Now, this is just day one of four days, so the the crowd's expected to continue to grow. There is so much to see here, so much to do, and so much, frankly, to phone home about. And of course, as those crowds grow, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right, Aaron? Because the world never has enough superheroes. That's the latest premiere in San Diego. I throw it back to you, Aaron. Top Story picks up coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.